would like to introduce, and it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Volkan Demir from Wilkins University, and also the NTU of Singapore. And I mean, this is something I would say very, it's, it's super great that, uh, I mean, one of the key figures in the world of semiconductor and crystals for optoelectronics is giving presentation for, for, for us, I mean, for students, for postdocs, for, for group leaders in such, I would say, uh, kind of, uh, I would say, in a similar format, not just the plenary talk. Therefore, guys, I encourage you to uh, ask questions to follow, and follow the presentation very, very precisely. And therefore, I would like to I would say give more to Professor Walton there. So please. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you uh, for your kind invitation. Uh, also, uh, thank you uh, here and many other colleagues uh, with whom I'm looking forward to working uh, within the mega grant uh, in the coming years. Um, so you can hear me well, or do I need to speak up a little bit? I uh, just want to make sure those uh, online joining us. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. All right, perfect. And then I think I'll just use this voice. Uh, so today I'll be talking about um, our research work on uh, semiconductor nanocrystal optoelectronics. This is um, developing a new uh, subfield within optoelectronics, uh, particularly using colloidal uh, materials, uh, starting from materials going to devices, and in some cases I'll show you systems. And uh, this is really an uh, effort of, of uh, many teams uh, in my group, but also those who I, I have been collaborating with uh, over the years. And what I will hopefully try to convince you that using colloidal materials, we can indeed push some of the limits. And in some cases, we can even break records. So this is, uh, in a way, for me, a journey I uh, took along with my group, starting originally with colloidal quantum dots, on the way, work with roads, uh, and most recently doing glass. Indeed, uh, I use some of these slides uh, already in some of the talks I have uh, given uh, within ITMO. Uh, for that reason, today I included some new slides that I think you have never seen. And those uh, that you might have seen, just to put everybody on the same page, I'll be quick, but the ones that I have not talked about previously, I will spend more of my time. Uh, just uh, as the chair um, uh, explained, um, I concurrently work at Deakin University and NTU Singapore. So what I'll show is really the result of the uh, teams both at Deakin and NTU uh, together. Uh, but uh, this mega grant uh, has a, a close connections uh, with Deakin University UNAM, uh, Professor Sergei Makarov and uh, many other colleagues. Um, uh, Ivan Anatoly and others already came and new uh, colleagues will be coming. So I'd like to show just a slide uh, what our campus looks like. Uh, this is uh, Bikant University campus. Uh, Bikant is a very unique place, um, what I call sanctuary, because it's very isolated. You can really concentrate on science. It's a private university, but it's non-profit and it currently ranks number one. Uh, in uh, fundamental sciences and engineering in Turkey. And it is a very interesting system, which I'm looking forward to sharing uh, with your president uh, this Friday. It has its own endowment. Actually, there is what is called Bicant Holding Companies, a large group of companies. But these companies also are nonprofit, and they can either expand business or only support university. Um, so the companies actually belong to the university, not the other way around. In some private places, uh, it is companies owning the university. Uh, for we can't, um, it is completely the opposite. And we have full academic freedom uh, at we can't fully independent. So our center, uh, UNAM, uh, which is a national center, uh, and again, many colleagues have seen, and I would like to welcome you all uh, uh, to come and visit us, spend time with us. It's a fully open lab concept. We really share everything. Uh, and uh, this is for us across uh, the country, but beyond the country. So um, we really would like to have open science environment. And we have over uh, 1,500 uh, accumulated users. 
Uh, currently, this center uh, itself is top ranking in terms of high impact science citation, nature index journals, uh, and other criteria so far. Can I ask a question yes. regarding this? Uh, oh, one for your question, <laughs> I have the right slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have raised it. <laughs> so, as for this 1,500 uh, users, uh, how many um, of them are really like two months or? Typically, we have around 400 okay. users. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a cumulative number mm -hmm. of unique uh, users. The actual number is 1,800, but for us, 1,500 was a milestone uh, which we targeted and already surpassed. So this is you, Sergey. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge uh, the mega grant, and it is really uh, thanks to colleagues here, and uh, Sergey has done a wonderful leadership uh, on this program, and I'm happy uh, to help in any way I can. So we see this as a close collaboration between uh, ITMO, Vic, and UNAM. And this is just from yesterday. So just for you to know, as I arrived uh, in the afternoon. Uh, again, I'll be acknowledging our uh, current research group. Uh, this is my group uh, at Vic, along with uh, alumni. Um, I'm most proud of uh, my um, uh, uh, PhD students who now themselves be be become uh, academicians. I have 10 professors uh, that came out of my group and working uh, different parts of the world. And this is uh, from NTU. Uh, also, I'm very happy to uh, acknowledge uh, my good friends and colleagues at NTU, along with our scientists, research fellows, research associates, all of them. Of course, the group has a wide a range of operation. Uh, one of them uh, is on semiconductor nanocrystals. And that's today what I will mostly talk about, particularly light generation, uh, emission and lacing. But we do also uh, have work on harvesting the silicon concentrators. And I'll show you a few slides on this. Um, we have been working on energy transfer and near field phenomena, uh, uh, also coupling with the electric and metal antenna and materials coupling and uh, functional media. And some of these already turned into commercial uh, efforts. Uh, to complement semiconductor nanocrystals, so we have been looking into light engines, uh, for example, high brightness LEDs, uh, which has been commercialized, nanocrystal LEDs. Uh, UV LEDs, this is also commercialized, and I'll show you deep UV light chips. This is a very cool concept, uh, which also um, has uh, recently been uh, commercialized. Um, uh, of course, um, in the interest of time, and maybe uh, to keep my talk coherent, I won't talk about the ideas uh, we pursue in implantable metamaterials. This is really uh, transferring ideas from optics to more RF domain, but the same concept uh, for example, in vivo sensing, this is uh, smart implants or uh, spatial props uh, for uh, magnetic resonance imaging. This is what I'd like to show you. This is quite recent, and I think uh, you have not seen yet, so I can talk a little bit about this. Um, this is uh, our new deep UV light chip technology. Um, uh, this uh, recently came out. Um, we have been working on this technology for now uh, over five years. Uh, it has been fully licensed, uh, well, patented, licensed, and now transferred to a company in Sweden known as Light Lab. So this is uh, what we uh, did in our group. It, 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 it is few centimeters wide and few millimeters thick chip. But what is uh, nice about this is that uh, it is uh, sub one euro. So it's a very cheap uh, chip, uh, quite uh, cost effective, uh, yet uh, it's Output power and efficiency are on par uh, with commercially available deep UV LEDs. This is what it looks like inside. Uh, it's not drawn to scale. Um, this uh, is actually a glass uh, which looks black, invisible, but it is actually fully transparent in deep UV. And when I say deep UV, we are looking at the wavelengths uh, shorter than 260 nanometers. Inside, uh, we have uh, zinc oxide nanorods uh, that we grow ourselves. We develop a special recipe to achieve this in a uniform way, because you can imagine we have a few centimeters white uh, substrate uh, 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 within which uh, we have it all covered with the array of uh, vertical nanorods. 
then uh, we have a special uh, technology to seal it. So it's actually high vacuum inside. Uh, this was the critical part that we had to develop. And what we achieved as a result, uh, we have quite stable operation. Uh, operating hours uh, exceeds thousands. And if you compare this, uh, for example, uh, the benchmark, uh, which is, as you see here, uh, the mercury lamp, uh, the uh, relative intensity is a function of ambient temperature. Uh, this is uh, one of the bottlenecks for uh, this well-known and quite mature mercury lamp technology. It is uh, heavily temperature dependent. In our case, we have very little temperature dependence. Uh, we can go below minus 20 Celsius degrees all the way up to uh, 80 Celsius uh, degrees. Uh, and the total optical output power we can achieve is uh, more than 20 milliwatts. This really changes. We can double it in certain designs. The minimum efficiency is 4%. It can go up to 8% uh, range uh, in this uh, spatial designs. Um, it has high operational lifetime, low temperature dependence, instant on and off capability. Again, this is uh, some major um, uh, uh, drawback in mercury lamps. It takes uh, minutes uh, to warm up and then uh, to provide the UV. Uh, this is a, a very uh, well-known figure of merit used in deep UV disinfection. Uh, it's known as germicidal efficiency. What you do is you literally count uh, the number of units as a function of the dosage. And this is how you uh, measure uh, 99 uh, uh, point how many decimals of nine uh, you can achieve uh, uh, for disinfection. And this is called log uh, six uh, as uh, far as the terminology goes. And we have complete freedom. So this technology, we are very excited. Um, uh, uh, and uh, now that it is uh, fully commercialized, um, we are uh, developing the next generation of devices. Today, I won't talk about this, but I thought maybe it's cool to share with you as I have not had a chance before to do so. Uh, yes. What was the material uh, for, for the material? Okay, uh, so uh, uh, maybe it's hard to see. Yeah. Uh, we have UVC phosphor here. We can use variety of phosphors. Um, uh, we are now going into multi quantum valve structures. Uh, these phosphors uh, actually are um, uh, simple mixtures um, in a certain garnet. And uh, currently, uh, we use different vendors uh, to. Uh, get the spe specific spectral content we desire. Mm -hmm. It turns out that uh, the highest efficiency is peaking at 265. So that's uh, where our spectral, which I didn't show here, has the highest peak point. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we are now working on a new phosphor that will allow emission below 220 nanometers. So this is really, really short wavelength. Yep, so, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And what's the pumping scheme from this? Oh, thing? okay. Well, um, this, um, uh, maybe I can use uh, this uh, cross-section schematic mm -hmm. to explain. Uh, we electrically drive uh, this chip uh, uh, under high bias, but very, very low current. That's why our total electrical uh, power consumption is little. Uh, but uh, with high vacuum here, uh, which is really the key, we generate electron beam. So it is uh, the uh, 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 E-gun, if you think on a chip, um, and uh, this uh, electrons uh, with just carefully designed to achieve the right energy uh, uh, leads to cathodoluminescence mm -hmm. on phosphor. So we actually collect the, the cathodoluminescent light yeah. out of this. Um, uh, to keep the cavity uh, integrity here is essential to achieve high efficiency, but it is well-known cathodoluminescence uh, phenomenon, uh, which uh, That's can... That's why you need vacuum, right? That's why we need vacuum, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, and the efficiency is high because uh, with right modeling and right design, uh, you can uh, hit the uh, uh, kilo electron volt range you need uh, for this uh, E-beam. Uh, you generate inside. Okay, I'll be faster here because I already uh, talked uh, parts of this uh, previously too for, for uh, as far as I can tell most of the audience here. I think um, it is also well known to everyone here, semiconductor lighting uh, is essential and this is driven by 
energy efficiency versus cost benefits. But uh, to go along with that, uh, quality lighting is also important. And one reason why we didn't see so state lighting uh, fully um, deployed up to now uh, uh, is partly due to the deficiencies in quality. And therefore, for large scale penetration, uh, we need to have high quality. Uh, but I think from energy point of view, it's already clear to everybody that uh, artificial lighting currently uses uh, 15 to 20% of global electricity generation. And indeed, uh, we can uh, uh, generate 50% uh, or more saving depending on uh, the chip, but all the way to the system design. Uh, of course, uh, for solid state lighting, uh, we do white LEDs. One approach is multi the chip that is color conversion um, they have both advantages and disadvantages uh, i won't go into details of this discussion but what i'll tell you is that uh, 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 different uh, system level demonstrations i'll be sharing with you today is based on color conversion uh, approach uh, which is indeed more cost effective uh, but the design has to be done right uh, to achieve uh, the efficiency levels you want in our case uh, we actually start with the led itself again Today, I, I won't be able to talk about it, but we really grow our own LEDs. We have our um, uh, MOCVD system uh, at our lab at NTU. Then we fabricate these devices, again, using our clean room uh, environment. Uh, indeed, um, uh, we have a quite high quality growth capability, uh, a very uniform uh, 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 crystal across the whole wafer, and also, uh, this uh, here shows uh, very good crystal quality. Uh, indeed, um, uh, uh, particularly on semipolar epitaxy, we have uh, collaborated with uh, UC Santa Barbara team uh, from NTU. So over the years, we developed these different generation of devices, um, going from lateral chip to flip chip to vertical and finally reverse vertical. Each time it becomes more and more complicated, but then we can target higher uh, optical output levels. This uh, at NTU together with NTU Singapore uh, has been commercialized. We use these platforms uh, here. This is a picture from our lab at NTU. So we start from scratch. We design everything ourselves, uh, model all internal devices, uh, 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 grow the crystal, fabricate them, and then integrate with our own uh, nano luminophores. Uh, this is a, a, a film version, uh, this is direct integration, and today that's what I'm going to talk about. So this is indeed a paradigm shift because previously it was believed you should have broad emitters, but as a matter of fact, uh, photometrically speaking, if you have a right combination of discrete emitters, you can do better. Um, here I show you one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, of course, yellow phosphor uh, together with blue would have the lowest color rendering property. Color rendering means uh, the ability to show the true colors of an illuminated object. But then you can go to red-green phosphors. You can do better, but there is a limit uh, to how well you can do. Uh, particularly, the problem is uh, to have the warm white shade, uh, which means the color temperature has to be low. This works in opposite way uh, uh, for color temperature. You need lower color temperature to make it look warm. Uh, uh, to human eye uh, and uh, to achieve a uh, higher rendering at the same time has a fundamental trade-off as I'll show you with the spectral efficacy. So it's, it's limited. There are other problems uh, which I listed here. Um, in the case of narrow emitters though, uh, you can do much better. Uh, you can uh, make it quite warm at the same time, high rendering uh, while uh, sustaining high level of uh, spectral uh, efficiency. But there are other problems you need to address, and I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, for example, stability, making it eco-friendly. But in principle, our rationale has been uh, to uh, go for quality uh, white LED lighting using this type of colloidal quantum dot-based nanophosphors because uh, we can actually control all the features of emission. And this discussion came out uh, several years back uh, already some time now uh, on rare earths uh, because um, it actually uh, uh, rare earth elements are available only through very limited resources. This has been an issue and we were asked to uh, uh, extend this discussion uh, to point out that uh, indeed uh, instead of uh, rare earth based 
phosphors, uh, we can use semiconductor matrices, which are quite abundant, and uh, we can achieve uh, uh, color rendering, uh, uh, warm white shades with high spectral efficiency, all at the same time, uh, 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 in a way that it is impossible uh, with uh, conventional phosphors. And this work eventually turned into a big project, uh, which is itself now going uh, to uh, uh, deployment through this uh, uh, Turkish company. Uh, you may know this company is also well known in Europe and part of Asia. Uh, it's one of the largest TV manufacturers. Uh, the principle is very simple. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, this doesn't uh, 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 require any explanation for you. Obviously, uh, we have photoluminescence process, but you need to think carefully how to design the absorption because depending on the white shape, you really need to absorb certain amount and there is reabsorption, which you need to take into account. Photoluminescence is there, uh, but at the same time, depending on how you bring together your quantum imagers, uh, there is a strong dipole dipole interaction. This could be something you desire, uh, or this could be something you may want to avoid. For example, if you have a, a bad defected subpopulation uh, with such strong energy transfer, uh, some of these uh, color converters will act as exton sinks. And then the penalty you pay in terms of efficiency is far much greater than uh, as just simple mixing. So these all have to be carefully designed. At the end, of course, the collective uh, R, uh, R, R, RGB, red, green, blue, uh, they'll give you the white shade you desire. So uh, in, in, in the meanwhile, uh, we have to study the exon generation, deassociation, recombination under high pumping multi exon generation and different types of exon transfer, which we have been looking into. And those uh, interested, uh, uh, we put together several years back uh, a review to explain all these uh, in the context of lighting. I think uh, for this audience, uh, I understand uh, part of you uh, has been doing synthesis, but uh, maybe the rest isn't. So just to acknowledge uh, uh, the uh, uh, important uh, uh, scientific contributors uh, in the colloidal uh, community, uh, Bob Andy uh, uh, from MIT, Alivi Satos uh, from Berkeley, and then also my good friends, uh, and also I believe your close colleagues too, uh, 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 Gaponik Talepin Rogac, uh, Müller, and uh, Veller uh, uh, from uh, Belarus, uh, 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 Germany um, uh, uh, team, uh, have been uh, really uh, showed us uh, in a very impressive way uh, using such uh, low uh, low cost setups. We can actually achieve uh, quite uh, high crystal quality. Coming from more uh, thin film at taxi, where I am used to using million dollars for uh, machines to do this, it's always impressive for me how uh, you can achieve uh, a, a, a almost unity efficiency in certain chemical routes with this setup here. So this is what I'm showing from our lab. Uh, you can do this low cost uh, solution based synthesis and thus processing and we can have an amazing control over shape size composition obviously this is to control and tune the structure and external properties in the light of lighting uh, we are interested in nanocrystals uh, particularly because we can tune uh, the absorption edge and emission peak very precisely and when i say precision here i am referring to one to two nanometers uh, uh, reproducibility. This is, uh, in my opinion, quite impressive. Um, uh, this is uh, really the result of the entire uh, synthesis uh, community over two decades, uh, uh, giving us the tools to do this. And then uh, the narrow emission is uh, essential. I know many of you are working on perovskites. Uh, this also intrinsically comes with perovskites with full width of maximum of about 20 nanometers. Um, uh, from photometric point of view, as long as you are narrower than 30, you don't really need to go 20, but that's wonderful. Uh, as long as you are uh, 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 with full width of maximum, uh, narrower than uh, 30, uh, you reach sufficient color purity uh, unit uh, for uh, lighting or uh, display applications. Of course, yes. Please, yes. Uh, with this color rendering, you, you talk that there is some limit uh, for right. phosphorus, but is there any like limit uh, requirements for in industry? 
let's say, as you told, that's uh, more narrow than 30, yes. it's not uh, reasonable for further uh, for, for industry. Yes, very, very, good, any, question. Any, any, very any good question. Very good question. So, uh, in all days, uh, since the lighting um, uh, uh, sector was not able to achieve uh, uh, such uh, narrow uh, 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 color converters, um, they have to have actually broad ones, just like phosphors, and then their rendering property was at, at best around 80, 80 ish, mm -hmm. never really reaching 90 or above. But quite recently, and I'll show you. Um, uh, that work uh, from Osram this summer, 2021, um, it is announced that they now have colloidal quantum dots uh, used as color converters. Therefore, they were able to reach 90 rendering uh, 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 and uh, at the same time uh, hit different uh, white shades, uh, including warm white shades. Um, this was simply impossible before. Uh, as a result, uh, the standards weren't there. Uh, and uh, uh, um, always uh, the sector pushed towards uh, just uh, electric efficiency, uh, but not talking too much about her seat uh, 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 color rendering and her seat uh, efficiency. Uh, I can give you a quick example. Uh, for example, uh, street lighting, uh, they would use the same LEDs. Uh, maybe electrically speaking, it's the same efficiency. You can obviously sight, but when it comes to perception of the human being, uh, those photons are simply the wrong ones. So uh, actually uh, you uh, effectively use fewer of the photons. It is the same for indeed uh, general lighting. General lighting, if you don't have the right spectral content, uh, either some of the photons are too much or some of them uh, in return are fewer. Uh, as a result, uh, um, uh, the, uh, 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 the limits uh, are actually uh, not because of the standards, but the limits uh, have been because of the perception uh, capability or incapability of human eye. Uh, this is now uh, coming up. So we will see more, more of this with higher uh, rendering, uh, at the same time, higher efficiency, but not using phosphors. Uh, this exactly this material system. So at the moment in lighting sector, Osram, from Germany is now leading this. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you should start, yes, there's maybe. Well, uh, I yeah. was just, so since these are uh, like uh, lighting applications, so yeah. there's no such question as in homogeneous broadening for this. So it, it, should, it should be just narrower than the light perception. Right, so th this, this uh, so at the end of the day, of, of course, human eye can't tell whether it is inhomogeneous or homogeneous broadening, as long as uh, it is narrow enough. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this political quantum dots I am showing you here uh, surely uh, suffer from inhomogeneous broadening. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically the size distribution would be five, uh, plus minus 5%, mm -hmm. uh, 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 but that is enough at room temperature to go below 30 nanometers. Um, but I'll show you later uh, for colloidal quantum wells, they have magic size and uh, they are only limited by homogeneous uh, broadening. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, unless uh, you make heterostructures, then of course, uh, inhomogeneous broadening may come into play. Uh, but at the end of the day, as long as you're narrow enough, uh, for lighting purposes, it just serves uh, its purpose. Yeah. Um, the efficiency is another critical point. Uh, I'll quickly highlight this one because uh, this is uh, not widely recognized. Um, and uh, this uh, has to do with uh, semiconductor nanocrystal being semiconductors. Uh, as uh, uh, I believe uh, all of you from physics, uh, just semiconductor material, it means low the band edge, it has a very broad absorption. Uh, unlike rare earth elements, so rare earth elements have absorption bands. It means when you need to put together the whole system, it is not only the emission peak you are trying to make sure is the right one, it is also the absorption band that will obviously need to match your uh, pumping uh, LED device. And surprisingly, again, not acknowledged enough in my opinion, 50% of all phosphors developed simply cannot make it uh, because of this requirement, because although their peak emission is right, their uh, absorption band is completely off. Uh, uh, for semiconductors, non-crystals, and uh, hair sky, for that matter, this comes for free. 
Um, obviously, stability, as I'll show you, is another critical uh, aspect to look into. So I'm happy to highlight Mega Grant here uh, a bit more. Uh, over the years, um, we generated these nano crystals, and we have been collaborating very heavily with universities, academia, and companies uh, worldwide. And um, uh, we are really uh, looking into three specific applications, uh, as I'll uh, discuss more, uh, general lighting along with uh, uh, screen bed lighting. And th th this is an example from our work, a, a review of uh, showing all this work and some new results there, along with uh, Samsung, uh, which was the first uh, to report uh, indeed uh, nanocrystal based backlight unit units in a, in a LCD display. And then as I'll discuss more nanocrystal lasers, uh, again, um, I'm happy to uh, acknowledge uh, Primov and uh, uh, Steve Dunk here. Uh, uh, we have our own motivation to go into colloidal lasing. And uh, nanocrystals find many other applications. Today, I won't talk about any of these, uh, such as single photon sources, solar cells, biolabeling, imaging. Uh, but focus only the top panel here. Um, maybe just a few words on color science. Uh, efficiency of the device is critical, but uh, perceived efficiency is essential. Uh, and this has to do with the human eye sensitivity curve. Uh, this curve is known as sensitivity. To make things a little bit more uh, complicated, uh, this is not a fixed curve. Actually, given the number of photons in ambience here, uh, this shift uh, this curve shifts. With fewer photons, it shifts to shorter wavelengths. And this shift is tremendous, it's 50 nanometers. Uh, so in between, you have the mesopic region and then you have the scotopic region. So depending on uh, where you would like to use your light, you really have to be careful about this. And this was completely overlooked uh, for many years. Now, uh, this is being uh, recognized for the right design of lighting. You can quickly uh, hear, um, uh, realize, uh, for example, for uh, road lighting, it has to be the scotopic regime one has to uh, uh, take into account. I'm sure you have this experience uh, under the street lamp. It looks very bright. Uh, even you have uh, uh, glare, uh, other complications uh, related to that. But then you walk a few steps away and maybe you may not even read a piece of paper. Uh, it is just because the photons are there, but they're not the right photons uh, given your eye sensitive curve. Uh, the other two aspects, uh, which I'm not going to go too much into detail, is one visual performance. This has to do with the shape of the white light uh, quantified by the color temperature. The other one uh, is uh, already what I um, uh, discussed to some extent, the rendering property. This is to show the uh, true colors. Uh, of, of the illuminated uh, object. And th this is now a new field opening up. Uh, it turns out that our emotions are triggered uh, by this property. Uh, and this becomes quite critical, for example, uh, in marketing, uh, in uh, shopping, so on. Um, again, I won't go into details of this, but because of this uh, color matching function of red, green, and blue cones, uh, we have a certain uh, uh, operating point in the color gamut. Um, we have a certain correlated color temperature. This red curve here shows the black body, the loci of black radiators, but we don't have to have a black body. Therefore, we define a correlated one. Uh, the rendering in this and luminous efficiency, that's what I'm going to talk about. The luminous efficacy just to give you maybe benchmark, incandescent sources uh, fall in the range of a uh, few pence. Uh, fluorescent lamps uh, below than 100, and then uh, white LEDs typically using phosphor below uh, 300 uh, lumens uh, per optical watt. I think you have a question. You yeah, want. Yes. I wanted to ask about sure. the true colors. So is it colors that are visible in some solar spectrum? Or, and what is the target solar spectrum like? What is the time of the day which has a reference uh, solar spectrum which gives this true colors? Or is there right. some other criteria? Good question. Um, uh, actually, uh, quantifying color rendering uh, is a difficult task, uh, and there is no uh, ideal way of doing it. Uh, this index, uh, CRI, is most probably one of the worst ways of doing it because it actually boils down uh, uh, the response to a single number. And it is normalized with respect to 100. 
and it uses black weather radiators as the perfect illuminators, uh, which is not necessarily true. Uh, uh, the way uh, it is uh, most commonly done is to use the so-called moon cell uh, samples. There are 14 of them. They have a different uh, 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 spectrum uh, compared to each other. And as any natural object, they have a very slowly varying reflection uh, uh, spectra. And you use these different uh, samples, uh, how close uh, you can reach to this reference uh, spectra for 14 samples. And it turns out that in certain cases, you will fall quite low. Uh, that will show the weakness of your uh, uh, light source. Uh, there is a, a, a two more modified uh, indices we use, which may be a little bit too technical, and I won't get into detail unless you're interested. They they are better, but none of them is perfect. So there's an effort actually uh, more in color science uh, to define uh, better metrics, uh, but there is no perfect one. Uh, this though still uh, in a relative sense. So maybe it is not an absolute measure of the ability to show the true colors, but it is truly relative measure to compare two sources, which is better. Uh, you can answer this question uh, using these uh, reference samples. So with that, what we are able to do, uh, we are able to do uh, color rendering uh, uh, of 90. Uh, we can go 90 and above. Uh, we can make warm white, uh, 3000 Kelvin, uh, which is a good warm white point. And uh, we can achieve a, a very high uh, uh, luminous efficacy, about 350 lumens per watt. At the same time, uh, which I didn't talk about, this ability to go to the scotopic regime where you have uh, fewer photons and your uh, eye sense detector has shifted to shorter wavelengths. There is a metric known as scotopic photopic ratio, SP ratio. Um, there is a hard limit how well you can do, and that's 2.5. Only with these sharp emitters, we can actually exceed this SP wall. So that's uh, what we achieved over the years. And the challenge is again, to do all of them at the same time. You can do one parameter or two, but doing all at the same time is simply impossible uh, using broad imagers. Um, I, I won't talk too much about maybe all the details, but um, I will show you uh, maybe the major findings uh, out of these uh, studies. It turns out uh, for red, uh, it's very critical and 620 nanometer, uh, as uh, we uh, identified, uh, has to be the wavelength uh, to use for general lighting, and it has to be sharp. And if you go uh, uh, shorter or longer than this wavelength, you have a major, major penalty you pay uh, in terms of the uh, color rendering property. The others are not as essential. Actually, you want blue to be weak uh, for uh, warm white, and then you need to fill in the between. Uh, this one, though, uh, has a major and quick trade-off. Um, this is uh, what um, we discovered. Uh, it is possible to go beyond 90, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in terms of rendering property with nanocrystals. But if you'd like to make it at the same time spectrally highly efficient, there's a trade-off. Uh, so uh, uh, as you try to go further out on the x-axis, uh, you need to uh, 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 trade off the performance with lower uh, rendering property. And as you go to warmer, so th this red one here is warmer, warmer white shape than others, this penalty becomes steeper. So th these designs have to be taken into account. This is the so-called SP, scotopic to photopic ratio wall. If this number is large, it means the light source you use is adaptable for scotopic regime. You can use it very efficiently in the mesopic regime and scotopic regime is very good. Scotopic regime is good because that's the dark adaptive vision, just like in a road or street. Uh, so all these technologies, which is actually, maybe you know some of them, these are the common ones uh, one would use uh, for uh, just highway lighting. Uh, these are the so-called uh, low pressure, high pressure uh, sodium lamps. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, at least uh, old technology uh, in Russia, uh, these will be used too. Maybe new ones are replaced by LEDs, uh, but still not enough penetration there. But what you see, they all fall below this SP ratio. So we can go beyond this, uh, which is critical. And this means 
uh, you can achieve a better uh, perception at the same output power. So we have been looking into this uh, clinical mergers and uh, uh, for us uh, to make cadmium free options uh, was essential. Uh, in the community, uh, there's a major effort going on and uh, we typically have uh, indium phosphide based solutions there. But uh, because we do have a dispersion, um, uh, one has to think about how to transfer these nanocrystals in solution to film and in a, uh, in a way that it, it uh, uh, imparts stability. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about such uh, uh, standalone films, or uh, you can think about uh, making these macrocrystals. This is in a way wrapping uh, the uh, nanocrystals uh, with some other type of crystal uh, to create uh, either this uh, macro scale crystals or some powder. Um, with indium phosphide, the good news is uh, you can actually uh, trace uh, the entire visible, so you can cover uh, the uh, spectrum as you desire, but you can immediately see they uh, uh, suffer from inhomogeneous broadening, so they do not provide as as pure color as you desire. Um, you can, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, embed these nanocrystals into uh, indeed uh, uh, powders. Uh, this could be ionic salt powder, for example. Um, and this is a, a, a collaboration uh, with uh, Technic University of Dresden team, uh, Kolya and um, uh, I are there. Um, and uh, uh, this is good news uh, because, uh, as you see, the efficiency uh, we can keep pretty high. Uh, and in principle, uh, we can do any nanocrystal of any combination, independent of the surface chemistry, using uh, this uh, liquid diffusion assisted approach, uh, which works well. But what we have been, yeah. Are they like a super crystals? Uh, or what's the difference between like super crystals where a uh, crystal consists of like building blocks? Each building block is one. Right. Of they're they are not as hierarchical uh, as you would have in super crystal. Uh, so, uh, they are uh, more forming in a, a random way. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, we make sure uh, monocrystals uh, are not aggregated, and we make sure uh, around each monocrystal, as far as we can tell. Um, uh, they are fully wrapped. As a result, uh, the efficiency also reported in this work doesn't drop. It actually slightly increases. The slight increase is not quantum mechanically. Uh, according to our um, understanding, we help to extract more of the photons uh, uh, than we would if they were in a closed pack film uh, because uh, we have more scattering uh, coming out. And the measurements actually uh, were uh, uh, double checked um, uh, for um, absolute quantum efficiency measurements here by uh, the National Lab in Germany, just to make sure our uh, measurement was right. Actually, um, they also verified uh, the quantum efficiency in absolute terms is increased. Uh, so uh, the randomness is there, but not uh, connected or aggregated. So individual uh, wrapping of microcrystals. So it's different than superstructures. Uh, this is what we are pushing. Uh, this is freestanding sheets of nanocrystals. Uh, uh, this was actually almost a decade ago uh, where we demonstrated uh, this is possible. Uh, the challenge was, uh, as you can imagine, uh, these nanocrystals being nano, you have to make it uniform uh, laterally, but then vertically, and it needed to do colors. Um, we were able to achieve this. Uh, now we can through tens of centimeters, half meter by half meter, and you can use them for many different purposes, including, for example, color enrichment in screens. And this has been commercialized now, not only a, a spin-off company, uh, uh, basically preparing these nanocrystals in liter volume. So within one volume, uh, you need sufficient nanocrystals uh, for, for example, uh, 40 to 50 TVs. So this is uh, 40 to 50 TV. And then we can make them in very uh, long uh, freestanding sheets like this. Uh, so it's a very low cost technology too and high performance. For example, this is a real picture. Uh, this is just standard uh, LCD based screen and it has its own color converter. Uh, we opened this up, cut the color converter into half, and for this right part, we kept the original one. Uh, for the left part, we put our own 
color conversion, uh, no, no, me. And uh, you can see by eye uh, the difference. And this is really coming from the color purity effect. And if you compare, for example, with respect to 3M, uh, we are slightly better uh, than their color span uh, 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 in this case. Uh, so, but what happens in this case? You put uh, this layer and then what happens reabsorption uh, so, so uh, we do have the big light unit we don't need to touch the big light unit we don't need to touch the liquid crystal display part uh, we have all these uh, film based uh, uh, passive optical components if you will uh, one of which is the color converter but then we have diffuser so uh, so we uh, just replace uh, the color converter film mm. uh, uh, so the conventional one uh, uh, is there half of it and the other half is ours um, uh, so this is uh, therefore um, really convenient for tv manufacturers because they don't need to change anything in their production line uh, 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 but then the end performance in terms of uh, the richness of the color directly comes from the quality of this color converter mm -hmm. so it's a key technology today uh, in TV sector, and maybe some of you might even have QD based TVs at home. Uh, the high segments of Samsung, for example, although they don't um, promote this, but uh, Insight uh, is the QD color technology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they are QD based color converters. Uh, most recently, um, most recently being within last one to two years, maybe uh, Samsung announced that they will be. Uh, continually uh, uh, investing over uh, 10 billion US dollars into QD technologies. Uh, so um, QD uh, made a big difference for LCDs because previously um, LCD technology alone couldn't find, couldn't, uh, couldn't compete uh, with organic based uh, LED screens. But now LCD in conjunction with QDs actually provide better performance than organic LEDs. Otherwise, we would have seen LCD technology and market would decline and organic LEDs uh, would fly off, but this is uh, now postponed at least 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So QD technologies now uh, have, uh, has already made LCD to prevail and we will see LCD technologies for quite a long time because of QDs. Okay, so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering what technology do you use to produce uh, uh, color plasmids or such before? Okay, we, we have a different routes. Uh, 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 some of them are now owned by none of me, uh, but just I can tell you they're not only color quantum dots, uh, they're also color quantum wells and mixture uh, and different uh, material systems. It's not only two six, uh, we have others too. Uh, so in principle, uh, we have different color components and we can mix them in any way we desire. Uh, either we use mixture or we use uh, stratified films. So uh, different films uh, brought together. Um, so there, there are, um, uh, they can also be synthesized in an automated uh, chamber. Uh, so it doesn't have to be manual either, but we can also do manual. So this is the whole story I wanted to uh, show you uh, here. It started with QD Vision, a spin-off from MIT, later on by Samsung. Uh, then uh, Samsung uh, actually killed this company. <laughs> uh, it's an unfortunate story, uh, particularly because their interest was in the uh, uh, TV screens. And only uh, uh, very recently, 2021, just this July, past July, uh, uh, we had a, a product that came out of Osram, and we knew they were working on this for a while, a single packaged uh, LED uh, having, uh, this is uh, their announcement. Uh, and here the rendering property is 90, uh, just like we predicted. And uh, we actually measured uh, their spectrum. The red is exactly 620 uh, nanometer as it should. Uh, so we are very happy that uh, uh, our uh, demonstrations that uh, they also uh, use or verified uh, themselves. Um, so I will go fast. Uh, you can do more uh, with these color converters. You can, for example, uh, impart colors, polarizing properties. So it's not only color conversion, 
uh, but at the same time, uh, you can uh, have uh, polarized emission uh, coming out of this. This is uh, a, a program we successfully completed with Samsung, uh, uh, two series of two programs. And uh, uh, now uh, Samsung is uh, in the plan of uh, looking into this type of structures. But um, all I showed you today was just uh, spontaneous emission-based polyconversion. And you can do further better. Um, this uh, uh, would be based then on laser uh, lighting. Uh, th th there is a very strong argument uh, from coming from the efficiency issues. Uh, this is uh, the argument of efficiency group. But then there are uh, additional benefits, such as better photon management. Of course, the question is, can you do this? And the answer came from my um, uh, friend and colleague, Jeff Sal from National Lab in the US. The answer is yes, I will uh, spare the details from you. Uh, if this is done properly, you couldn't tell that it is laser-based lighting. Uh, for that reason, we have strong motivation to study LASIK, and we have been looking for the best material to do that. This is one uh, we developed called the TIPIC uh, core, and then Shell has a smooth transition, near unit efficiency. We put into very compact device, everything, all solution process here, uh, the, the pair of bracket reflectors are uh, colloidal themselves. Uh, a very nice, uh, the best efficiency, the best uh, threshold at the time, but no matter what we did, uh, we always hit limits. These are the limits uh, in terms of order of magnitude, what you can do. Uh, and the limitation comes really fundamentally from the urge recommendation along with a uh, low uh, absorption cross-section. So, uh, yes, one, yes. Yeah. yes, of course. Sorry, I have just a general question. In terms of our perception, do we uh, discriminate between the coherent light or thermal light? Uh, like, can our eye actually perceive the statistics of, uh, of radiation? Or we don't care. It, 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 so, laser lighting, if it is not done properly, uh, it may suffer from speckle issue. Mm -hmm. But if it is done properly, uh, according to these studies, actually, you couldn't, wouldn't tell the difference compared to incandescent lamp versus laser mm -hmm. face lighting or any type of uh, white LED. Uh, well, uh, cool, warm, or neutral or white LED. So by human eye, uh, if, done, if it is done properly, it's undetectable. Um, so that's one aspect. Uh, so that then tells me uh, uh, in the right conditions, we can't tell uh, uh, coherent versus incoherent. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we see that uh, in the future, uh, especially uh, certain lighting uh, schemes. Uh, for example, uh, 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 high segment uh, headlamp, uh, headlamps of cars uh, will be laser-based lighting, uh, uh, particularly because they have the steering uh, uh, capability. Or micro LEDs, but micro LEDs, when they go small size, uh, they become, of course, they are still uh, incoherent compared to laser, but they are partially, spatially more coherent than large uh, surface uh, LEDs. Uh, so we will see, I think, more and more coherent uh, uh, light sources being used in lighting and in screens in the future. Yeah, but uh, it's quite understand that to avoid this speckle problem, one should uh, reduce a special coherence of the source, yeah? You, you can, and then the, the, there are the diffusers, uh, you so use some other passive mm -hmm. optical components, uh, but at the end, as a system, uh, the output, you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, I know I'm, uh, uh, well, with questions. Uh, no they, rush, I mean. No rush, okay. I'll, well, I, I will still be quick in certain aspects and try to highlight maybe more of the new things. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to use this uh, observation as our uh, motivation for uh, going into quantum well-based nanocrystals. Uh, because the thresholds here, you see hundreds of microjoules per centimeter square. Um, uh, there is no way uh, you can reduce this in a, a significant way. Uh, uh, this is accompanied by small gain coefficients in the range of uh, hundreds of inverse centimeter. And uh, if you look at the gain lifetime, that's also ultra short. So all of these fundamental barriers we can address uh, using quantum loss. 
and uh, you you are uh, both probably aware of the progress in the community and um, this is uh, uh, first systematically uh, synthesized and um, demonstrated in CNRS uh, Paris uh, French uh, group. Uh, 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 previously there were observations, but uh, none of them were really systematic. And uh, this work was quite inspiring uh, for us because you can very reproducibly achieve atomically flat nanocrystals and they have magic vertical size, uh, which means uh, correspondingly, uh, we can really control uh, their uh, optical properties. Uh, and then uh, uh, instead of just making core, you can think about having a, a heterostructure uh, using shell around them, uh, uh, or uh, you can only extend in 2D, uh, this is through an isotropic growth, and then have what we call core crown or core extension structure. Um, so with that, uh, we're looking into optotronics of flat nanocrystals. Uh, we want to make use of this extremely large surfaces uh, while we keep uh, the quite tight vertical confinement. So being the same thickness all across, it means we will have only uh, a, a homogeneous uh, broadening. And then um, we will also have, uh, because of this very tight confinement, giant oscillator strength. So absorption uh, cross sections, both linear and nonlinear, will be really, really large. And as we measured, actually, they are record high. Uh, so it's, it's great. Um, uh, which means if the absorption cross section is high, they will have a major emission capability. Uh, that's also uh, critical. Uh, and if we can make them near unity uh, efficiency emitters, uh, then uh, for light converter, uh, then going into gain, if we can induce gain, um, they have uh, a great performance potential. Uh, finally, uh, this is another aspect uh, which I really uh, find important, and we have been trying to exploit this direction, uh, that is to orient them, because we have now uh, uh, a high aspect ratio material. Um, uh, unlike uh, isotropic uh, colloidal quantum dust, we can choose to orient them uh, either face down or uh, put them uh, face to face and generate long chains and then immobilize in edge up configuration. That uh, brings about another degree of freedom for us uh, when it comes to structures and devices. So uh, we can make them very thin, few nanometers, we can make them very large tens to hundreds of nanometers literally, but then we can reduce this optical gain at least an order of magnitude, if not more. Uh, we can increase uh, the gain coefficient uh, to thousands in, of inverse centimeter regime, and we can actually routinely achieve long gain lifetimes, 150 picoseconds or longer. So this quantum object allows us to uh, really remedy all those uh, uh, fundamental challenges uh, we have identified with polar quantum dust. That's what we have been looking into. Again, I'll spare you of the details, uh, but quickly highlight here, uh, this is just a standard core crown uh, on a platelet at um, room temperature. This is seven to eight nanometers, very, very sharp, uh, full width of maximum. Uh, this is the red curve here. Um, and then you can see on the background uh, dotted black curve, that's the absorption profile. You can see heavy hole, light hole, external features, very well resolved. Result. And then you see the plateau, uh, which in my opinion is rare to see for a 2D quantum object. This is really textbook example of a true uh, 2D system. Um, so with the motivation of uh, strong uh, absorption cross-section, um, we wanted to look into single photon absorption-based pumping, and we're able to observe uh, lasing uh, for the first time at the time. Uh, and then uh, because the nonlinear absorption cross-section should also be very high, it should be possible to use two photon absorption. That's also what we did. And then identified that as expected in the early samples uh, of these both quantum laws we synthesize, uh, the gain coefficients uh, look higher. Yes, Ivan. So, yeah, I want to ask. So, sure. this gain lifetime it's critical for pulse duration, right? Right. So, and uh, if if so, then uh, do you think it's uh, it's critical for industry if uh, this laser light sources work in pulse regime or CW? Right. So, so uh, can you, for example, use uh, uh, vehicle lighting 
in past regime probably. Very good question. So uh, we keep pushing and uh, several other groups uh, as well worldwide. Um, uh, nanosecond is uh, doable. Uh, there is report of continuous wave uh, operation, uh, but uh, in my opinion, that still has some challenges to deal with. Uh, we can push the gain lifetime to nanosecond now, very routinely. Um, we have one uh, specific uh, heterostructure that allowed to go beyond uh, nanosecond regime. We are now trying to understand this better. So I think um, we will have longer and longer gain lifetimes. Uh, nanosecond uh, 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 pumping is straightforward. I think we will have either quasi uh, continuous wave or fully continuous wave operation that routinely too. Uh, but there's already a scientific report on continuous wave uh, pumping, although I have to say some numbers don't match, uh, but uh, that has been reported. Uh, so, so um, but is it really necessary to go all the way to continuous? It depends wave on the application. Very good question. So, for lighting, for many applications, uh, as long as uh, uh, we are beyond the uh, uh, rep rate per, uh, of the human eye uh, in terms of perception, uh, you, you couldn't tell the difference. Uh, uh, but but uh, uh, there are other applications I think uh, will require continuous wave at some point. Um, but for lighting, uh, you're right, nanosecond will be just fine. So um, I will quickly highlight here, uh, we have been pushing the material quality to see how far we can go in terms of the net model gain. This time we are using just poor, but really high quality material. Uh, and you can see, we can really push uh, the net peak model gain. This is uh, the best reported gain coefficients thus far in terms of the net peak model gain uh, for organic dyes, polymers, colloidal quantum dots, rare earth based fibers, epitaxial quantum dots, all room temperature. They uh, fall below uh, 2000 inverse centimeter. These are three monolayer, four monolayer, five monolayer of these colloidal quantum dots. So just to put in a perspective, this is the best, the highest uh, reported uh, peak model gain uh, coefficient we found. In literature uh, that belongs to uh, gallium nitride, bulk gallium nitride, of course, cryogenic temperature. Again, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I know many of you working on perovskites. Perovskites also great, uh, bulk perovskite, but cryogenic uh, uh, lie in here. So th th these uh, at room temperature uh, uh, look very promising. Uh, to put this in a perspective for material gain, what I showed you was the model gain. You can predict the material gain. Um, and we think uh, we, we, we have gotten here now uh, with our giant uh, 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 colloidal quantum mass. Uh, this is material gain uh, should be at room temperature surpassing 10,000 uh, inverse centimeter regime. Uh, this then tells us that these colloidal material systems uh, really uh, now compete uh, with epitaxial uh, materials. Uh, I won't go into details of each and every one of them, but just to tell you that uh, this field, in my opinion, is very rich, uh, just like in perovskite, uh, there are so many different things one uh, can uh, look into. Uh, I think quite interesting. Uh, we were able to identify core size dependent optical gain, crown size dependent optical gain, uh, optical gain in platelets in a box type of architecture and tuning. I'll tell a little bit about these type two alignments so on. And this is something I'd like to share because I think this is also very promising, but we are at the very beginning of uh, this um, uh, system. And this is the thinnest uh, color quantum well we can do. Um, uh, thermodynamically, using our approach, it is impossible to go to single layer. Uh, this is a, a, a cadmium uh, interlayer, uh, but then termination with uh, cadmium on both sides. It's a symmetric structure. Uh, in literature, this is called two monolayer, but in my opinion, we should call it 2.5 uh, monolayer. Uh, but that is achievable. And surprisingly, uh, this can be extremely high efficiency. So this one uh, reaches 90% efficiency in solution. Again, I won't go into the details of uh, uh, the, the, um, the work here, uh, if you're interested, I'll be happy to talk more, but we'd like to push this ultra thin colloidal quantum well structure for game purposes too. This brings me uh, to the last uh, two topics here. One is heterostructures. Uh, again, uh, I won't maybe dwell too much on each of them, but just share with you, this is also very rich. 
um, aspect of uh, nanoplates, you can be very imaginative on coming up with different heterostructures. You can alloy them. Uh, you can uh, create a uh, core crown core shell or core crown shell, uh, joining the strategies, uh, heterostructures. You can uh, think about uh, electronic band alignment. Uh, what I showed you was mostly type one. Now I'll show you an example for type two. You can even tune it. So this is uh, a, a, a really a great grand play uh, for us uh, because we can literally um, design the electronic structure and therefore the as an outcome optical uh, uh, properties. Uh, uh, you can do type one, alloy them all. You can do inverse type one. This is like a quantum ring. This is an early example. The ring here uh, doesn't look exactly uh, like a, a circular ring, but these days uh, we can do rectangular rings better. Uh, type two, uh, I mentioned uh, we can align type one. Uh, this is three dimensional. It's like plated in a box structure. I won't go into the time because of the time, just tell you it's not so straightforward. Uh, one would imagine maybe in this case, for example, tuning uh, cadmium selenide uh, with cadmium selenide telluride crown with selenide telluride compositions in the crown uh, changed, uh, you would have just linear response. It turns out that, uh, for example, uh, this type of architecture requires an optimal point. Uh, so uh, this is the starting benchmark, no alloying, and uh, you add uh, selenite into the cadmium telluride, for example, 25% uh, composition, you improve it, you uh, add 25 more, reaching 50% selenite, you do the best, but if you go more, it comes back. So we now have good understanding why this is happening, and it has to do with gain lifetime. So actually, 50% selenide in the crown uh, has given us the longest uh, gain lifetime. And in type 2, uh, this is uh, reaching uh, uh, 400 uh, picoseconds. And when we study this uh, further, uh, although the uh, gain coefficient is not the highest because gain lifetime is long, uh, we can achieve high performance. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Is it due to a uh, reduction of Roger combination slower or? Uh, yes, the, the, uh, basically we um, avoid uh, strong overlap of the uh, electron and hole wave functions. Uh, as a result, uh, the uh, lifetime extends uh, and OJ is further suppressed. Mm -hmm. But the gain coefficient also drops, mm -hmm. uh, which is undesired. It's affecting the opposite way, but at the end, this effect prevails and does the best the best uh, performance. The reason why there is an optimal point is because these two competing effects mm -hmm. uh, come into play. And the uh, sweet spot is where these two effects are balanced. So gain coefficient is not yet too low and the uh, gain lifetime is mm -hmm. uh, uh, long enough. Uh, the effect of two uh, gives us the best. That's why there's an optimal point. Otherwise it would keep getting better and better, but it doesn't. All right, so uh, we can do, as I mentioned, a low tether structure. Um, I will just show you the tuning capability. This is a core crown. What I show you here is uh, a cadmium selenide um, uh, sulfide a core with cadmium sulfide. And in this case, um, uh, X, uh, which uh, denotes the fraction of selenide is one, meaning there is no sulfur. Uh, going from this first, curve and downwards, we add more and more selenite up to 30%, uh, which this means we can tune, uh, 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 we, we, we should be able to tune, but as you see, the tuning, uh, uh, you can clearly see uh, is not there. What we do therefore, uh, we add on shell. Now these curves, which I showed you, these are the original ones I showed you in the previous slide. So for all of them, we basically do one monolayer cadmium sulfide shell coating, each of them separately, two monolayers, two monolayers. So as a whole family of curves, we can actually keep shifting them. And then the emission, we can tune nicely. This is uh, uh, also uh, uh, manifests itself in the performance. Uh, this is a Lloyd core. Uh, 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 this core, um, uh, we can uh, have crown around them. Uh, and uh, when we achieve uh, the whole thing, this is the best uh, performance. So if you combine the two, 
this is core crown, core shell, we can generate uh, tuned uh, emissions because we are using magic size. Normally we will have discrete uh, tuning. We wouldn't be able to cover in between, but this is possible. Uh, core crown shell is another uh, critical uh, approach. Um, this is uh, just core with different crown. Uh, we can see that crown actually helps to uh, suppress the fast hole trapping. This is fast hole trapping here. With crown, we avoid completely. This is uh, almost one exponential there. Then uh, a, 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 with shell, uh, a, again, all around, uh, we can, uh, as the whole family, shift uh, once again. And uh, you can uh, see this is reflected in the photolimicity decay curves. Uh, we can understand why this is happening. Again, I don't have time to discuss. Uh, we can go to uh, the uh, short wavelength tail and long wavelength tail and identify what the lifetime is, how the lifetime is affected. And that we find is we really conclusively with these two set of measurements uh, show that we indeed suppress uh, the full trapping. And at the end, as a result, I will just come, uh, I will just cut the chase and come to the uh, punchline. Uh, using uh, core crown shell, uh, we achieve the best. And at the cross section, this would look like this. Actually, shell coating should extend a little bit beyond crown. We have six hours continuous excitation. But this one, uh, we can combine with hot injection shell growth. It's a spatial shell growth we developed. Uh, this technique is particularly important because the growth takes place at high temperature. Because it's that temperature, it's very stable. Actually, hot injection technique is very well known for colloidal quantum dots, but was not available for colloidal quantum wells. We developed this for high efficiency purposes, you see there, high stability under high photon flux and high temperature. But then most importantly, we can use them for different purposes. Um, this hot injection shell growth enables high performance. This is just an example for LED. This is another example for laser application. In LED, this is the highest efficiency reported. The structure is not uh, novel. Uh, it is actually quite conventional, but the uh, active material is high quality. That is the reason for high efficiency. This one is a uh, solar, uh, sorry, solution-based laser using exactly the same material. This, uh, again, the structure is just standard, but uh, the gain material, uh, because of this injection, uh, allows for three orders of magnitude reduction in the uh, lacing threshold compared to the best uh, reported thus far. Now that we have core crown alloy hot injection shell growth, we can do one step further. We can very carefully design the uh, quantum structure. And this is carefully designed stepwise, generating uh, effectively a, a soft barrier. So this is in the shell. Now with that, uh, we were able to uh, discover sub-single external level of optical gain per particle. Uh, in the ensemble. This is again, therefore record level. You can go to high stability, you can make the lasing out of this. This now uh, brings to the end. Uh, I will be quick here to telling you, uh, you can stack them partially. You can understand the exton transfer between them. There is a major difference extonically between all face down, all edge up. Their even temperature dependencies are different. Um, uh, you can think about energy transfer between them. This is from four monolayer MPS, five monolayer MPS, and one would have expected quite high efficiency, but because of stacking, it limits the efficiency. This is in reality how it happens. Instead, you can use them with colloidal quantum dots, have very strong efficiency, uh, you're reaching 90%. You can use them as thermal probe. This is a remote probe, if you desire. This is one-to-one -one reading from efficiency. You can tell the temperature. You can go to different combinations, uh, quantum mass to, for example, to the material molten disulfide. And uh, what we find is uh, normally you would have expected D to the power minus four, this is dependence, but because of the strong delocalization, instead of D to the power four, two D to two D, we actually achieve D to the power minus two. Uh, this is coming from, as we understand, uh, 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 widespread of the field, both uh, in the donor and acceptor layers. You can uh, pair down with quantum dots, uh, think about uh, indeed orientation dependence, 
with orientation dependence uh, now to understand energy transfer, uh, having uh, monoplate is all face down or all edge up. Um, uh, uh, electromagnetically, you would expect the same dependence, uh, which uh, we find d to the power minus four, but because of the stacking, we have actually further expanded uh, faster radius. Finally, and this is within the stacking discussion, uh, you can multi-stack them. Uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, interesting as a bottom-up approach uh, where uh, you use them almost like Lego, Lego units. Uh, this is 11 uh, monolayers repeated, uh, 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 looking at the cross-section. We don't observe significant roughness increase. Uh, we are still within few nanometers range. Therefore, uh, this whole uh, structure, which is 80 centimeters square wide, quite large. Uh, this is a human eye on my graduate student's uh, uh, hand. Um, uh, you can actually have AC uh, across the entire structure under pumping conditions but there is a limit how thin you can do. This requires at least uh, five uh, monolayers of the deposition of the MPS. Only at the sixth one, there is a jump to support the optical mode to create uh, a sufficient uh, gain sustained in the guided mode. Uh, finally, doping. Uh, I typically have little time to talk about this, but this is equally important in my opinion. I'm sharing this maybe uh, to inspire some ideas in the mega grant, I think doping is something uh, surely uh, 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 quite open. Um, uh, this is, for example, one we did with copper, uh, you can do with manganese. Uh, this one is also, uh, this is Bicant. Uh, you can use this for uh, luminescent solar concentrator and uh, it's 90% efficiency. Um, so you can actually, uh, as you can see here, this is uh, with QD, um, uh, uh, we can have uh, higher uh, performance. Uh, finally, uh, again, maybe an idea to think about in mega grant, uh, the, instead of passive devices, also for uh, solar uh, or uh, for sensing applications, one can make active devices. Uh, this is uh, actually uh, 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 nanocrystals in this case uh, that are uh, self-assembled here, but their band gap uh, is going through a gradient. Uh, here we have red emitting ones. On the other side, we have the green ones. So the band alignment looks like this. And they are um, uh, quantum mechanically isolated, uh, but electromagnetically pairwise coupled. Therefore, any exton uh, formation observes, uh, uh, goes through a strong uh, diagram dipole coupling, basically uh, in a, like a staircase uh, coupling energy uh, from the adjacent uh, layer to the next, uh, going from the wider band gap to the uh, narrower band gap. So we can really funnel uh, exton and the performance of this is uh, more than only using red, for example, or only using green. Finally, I'm, I'm really <laughs> able to conclude uh, with some major uh, uh, the time I'm taking from you. Um, uh, well, nanocrystals enable high performance. Uh, that's the starting motivation, but I think they go far beyond. Uh, uh, they induce record gain uh, levels and extra long first radius. I think stacking, we, we this is something, that, in my opinion, uh, we should exploit in the community and surely doping is a new tool. With that, I'm happy to uh, acknowledge funding our book with Sergey and please come uh, to UNA, visit us. Uh, we have a lot of labs, a lot of research opportunities. And finally, uh, finish with this uh, final remark, uh, which came out uh, October uh, 2019 uh, in, in Nature Nanotechnology, uh, talking about UNA as uh, one of the crown jewels of Big Bang University. We hope uh, we'll be able to continue with our partners. With that, uh, we do have positions available if you want to visit. And thank you very much. Professor. impressive results and very inspiring talk. So I would like to probably start the discussion. We still have, I guess, five to 10 minutes. So anyone, any questions? Yeah. Everyone is dying uh, yeah, so sure. much. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, I am so excited to <laughs> have a lot of energy to talk to you. Uh, so uh, I have a general question regarding the gain measurements. So as, as far as uh, so you, you showed this uh, nice map with records for different temperatures.
and so on. And as I understood, uh, you, uh, this data uh, was measured in this uh, variable length uh, uh, this method when you measure it with a cylindrical lens, variable stripe uh, method, yeah? The and, variable uh, stripe length, yeah, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And also there is another method, it's a transient absorption method. Yeah, yeah transient absorption. We, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. also uh, sometimes use that to measure more recently. As we have yeah, the my question is uh, uh, having compared the results from these two methods because as far as understood, the variable stripe method is like for model game, and then you somehow should reconstruct the material game. Okay. From a transient absorption game, you uh, in principle measure directly uh, gain of the material, right? yeah. and uh, and also uh, simply gain maybe somehow can be estimated just made by measuring alpha absorption. You see that uh, density of uh, states is uh, corresponds to uh, you know some value in absorption, and then gain means the maximum gain is limited by this absorption. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what what do you think maybe? Uh, um, what the interconnection is between all these three uh, methods, and uh, uh, because uh, for bulk perovskites, we are we from alpha from just simply from absorption, we see the very high value of alpha, mm -hmm. and then we can say, okay, maybe gain is also very huge, but no, I mean, I, I didn't find any good measurements of gain for even for standard perovskites uh, like cesium lead bromide. And what can you recommend? Uh... Yeah, very good question. So um, uh, we have been uh, using a variable stripe length technique, uh, which is uh, well known uh, in uh, tin film epitaxy, uh, started with Gallimard night and other uh, crystals, uh, special tin films, uh, and used for a long time. Um, uh, because it's a, a, a easy to set up and easy to measure. Um, most recently, uh, we finally got the transient absorption system. Previously, uh, we did some collaborative efforts, but of course, it was not a systematic tool we could use, uh, only at the end to verify results. Now, uh, we start comparing. What we observe is uh, they are surely correlated. Mm -hmm. uh, the trends uh, we observe uh, uh, in both uh, uh, two independent uh, systems of measurements but uh, the numbers don't exactly match, uh, but not too off either. Uh, uh, and you're right, in variable strike length, at the end of the day, uh, for example, it's a thin film, uh, we are directly measuring model gain. Uh, so the model gain, of course, one has to uh, extract the material gain uh, uh, with some uh, uh, gamma factor overlap uh, integral calculation. And uh, at the end of the day, um, you are, uh, um, making uh, uh, assumptions where, for example, uh, scattering is not there, you assume perfect the thin film, uh, so on. Uh, so your gamma factor uh, is not 100% right, but then it becomes as a divider. So any small error you make in the gamma factor comes out to be a large one in the material gain. Uh, so the, the, um, the uh, error is amplified. Um, so it is there. Uh, in the absorption uh, gain coefficient measurements, though, um, um, we also uh, observe complications uh, coming from the setup. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just uh, uh, the setup itself, uh, in our case, it's not a strict camera and we use pump prop. Uh, mm -hmm. So we really, it takes really long time to construct the whole uh, curve um, uh, under different influence uh, levels. And, uh, um, we do observe variation in, uh, in for example, uh, the actual uh, temperature of the sample as we do our measurements in a passive way. Uh, so uh, uh, I personally like showing them both uh, and discussing the discrepancy, but then also the correlation, but we didn't, we never got exactly the same numbers. Mm -hmm. However, they look all meaningful. Um, uh, and uh, material gain uh, uh, obviously very much also depends uh, at what confluence uh, you measure this, which is not really uh, very systematically reported. Mm -hmm. uh, you would typically find a single curve with uh, population inversion, transparency point, and then some negative absorption but uh, rarely see the line of curves, uh, uh, unlike some uh, studies 
And that's also, in my opinion, important to do uh, for um, uh, uh, direct transient absorption measurement. A direct transient absorption measurement, you have less capability in terms of the maximum output power uh, you use, at least for our setups, uh, to, to pump the samples. So I, I personally think there are both techniques have its, their own weaknesses, mostly coming from the, uh, the bottlenecks in the setup. Uh, but uh, numbers in our case are not too off, uh, although not identical. So my thinking would be we should do all <laughs> and then uh, try to relate them. So I, I don't think one technique uh, is uh, better than another. This is my uh, view on it. Yeah. For bulk, uh, I think you might have difficulties to pump all the way in. Uh, so uh, uh, when you say bulk periscite, you are thinking of really large pieces so or microcrystal micro crystal area. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, as long as you can uh, generate uh, a population inversion across the entire structure, which I believe is not so easy to do. Uh, In you, micro crystal? Yes. Yeah, if it's uh, relatively thin, let's say okay. hundreds of nanometers. And so it's still thick, like uh, thin, so like a disk. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, have micro, micro you press micro. and. Uh, okay. No, it can be synthesized. Synthesized in thin, like platelets, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, uh, I'm not really yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, thanks, Sergey. Anybody? So, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Then, you said your. Go down and for the shelf on from uh cadmium cell nice nanoplatelets uh that occur for a certain uh, sequence. So uh, this sequence is defined by metric size. Yeah. Right. And, uh, oh, but what what define uh, what defines metric size? Right. So um it, so uh, first of all, why we have metric size is because uh, uh, given certain uh, reaction conditions. Uh, there is a specific time window within which only, for example, three monolayers will emerge. Uh, as long as you are within that time window, uh, all uh, the nanoplates that you uh, obtain in a single batch will be three monolayers. Then there is the next time window, uh, a distinct one, uh, it will be all four monolayers. So uh, these time windows um, may be further controlled uh, with uh, the um, uh, precursor concentration, temperature, uh, so on. But for a fixed set of parameters, you have different uh, time windows uh, uh, where you will have only one distinct uh, uh, nanoplatelet of a specific thickness. So we can, with that, we can achieve very routinely three monolayers, four monolayers, five monolayers, six monolayers. And uh, it was not previously possible to do two monolayers, uh, as I showed you. Uh, uh, it, it is possible, but the material quality, I think, is lower. We need to improve. And only recently, uh, we think we can achieve seven, but it's a mixture. Uh, so uh, uh, um, this uh, magic size um, doesn't come about uh, 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 anytime you'd like. Uh, it has to have the right uh, combination of uh, reaction uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, uh, within those conditions, we use time to uh, obtain specific molars, time and temperature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do we observe some so if it is magic size, we don't need to do any post synthesis to, for example, do size selective uh, uh, approach in general. We can have maybe, uh, uh, because of the impurities, some residual uh, subspecies, but they can come, they will come only small amounts. For example, in certain routes, uh, we can have some uh, uh, colloidal Dots, but very small amount and easy to separate. The nanoplate, the store will be magic size. Uh, if we go to seven monolayer, thicker ones, it gets a little bit more complicated. But from three to six, I would say quite uh, routine and uh, no need for any uh, serious uh, uh, size selective uh, uh, um, process. Mm -hmm. So uh, the process uh, 
in which, uh, for instance, we uh, or three monolayer uh, nanoplatelet is deposited on the top of five monolayer nanoplatelet, and uh, this reaction gives uh, uh, eight monolayer. Okay. So, so it is not, um, and, and maybe I was misunderstood, it is not that uh, we wait for a long time and then eventually three becomes four, four becomes five. Uh -huh. uh, the combination uh, uh, of the uh, uh, reaction parameters, particularly temperature uh -huh. being the most important one, but then you need to get the cursor concentration right to go with it, uh, has a specific time window. That time window, these are all separate uh, uh, synthesis, but if you plot them uh, as a function of time and what material you obtain, you will see that uh, it will take longer and longer each time, although there are different uh, reaction conditions, but they are almost side by side mm -hmm. uh, uh, within certain time window you will achieve. So it is not, you will start with one set of condition and wait long enough and eventually it will become thicker and thicker. You need to get the right uh, combination of parameters. But it turns out that in general, regardless of the other conditions, you need longer time to grow thicker uh, samples, which is not surprising. This is very common. So uh, uh, we have uh, looked at how they look like. They're really uh, specific time windows uh, uh, adjacent to each other. Uh, of course, each one has to have the right conditions. Mm -hmm. And, and it is, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, quite forgiving because the time windows are rather large. So it's not, uh, you know, you need to hit it right uh, exactly. Uh, so uh, it has quite a bit of tolerance. Yeah, thanks. So and probably one short question from my side. So I wonder what is this threshold uh, dependence of the layer? Uh, in layer uh, dependence. So you, you, you mentioned just very quickly that there's certain threshold numbers of layer that we should have like a very sharp improvement of the game. So can you please comment? Sure. Um, uh, our observation is um, th there are different uh, competing effects that uh, come into play at the same time. Uh, in general, um, made, making the um, quantum object bigger uh, uh, should increase the gain coefficient, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, it will uh, keep decreasing the threshold, uh, because uh, in certain cases, at the same time, you may end up with shorter gain lifetime. Uh, in, and if that happens, typically there is an optimal point uh, which gives you the lowest threshold. If you keep going, it will start coming back. Uh, this, for example, we observe uh, with part two band alignment, uh, adjusting the band offset um, to favor um, the overlap, uh, thus increase the gain coefficient, but eventually uh, the threshold drops because once they're separated, uh, the lifetime drops. Uh, that's the reason. And we also observe this if we keep increasing the number of monolayers, uh, it uh, uh, gives us higher, uh, well, reduced, more and more reduced gain uh, threshold, but eventually uh, it also comes back. So uh, there is always in these cases an optimal point uh, uh, that gives us the best performance uh, because of these competing effects. Oh, yeah. Sergey, final question, question, I guess. From the side of the Exitonic guys <laughs> who are sitting here. So you showed very nice uh, absorption, like textbook as it's absorbing yeah. spectrum. So it's like heavy side function yeah. and last two peaks. So it's understood the first peak is a uh, heavy uh, hole, light uh, hole. Uh, ah, heavy hole and light hole. hole. Okay, I see. Yeah. And the question is what is the binding energy for this main exciton? And the second question, uh, have you seen any works on reporting for the polaritonic uh, lazy in such systems? Uh, well, I, I, I can um, start. Uh, there is, uh, the best of my knowledge, uh, there is none reported thus far, so it is also open. Mm. Um, uh, my good friend and uh, colleague uh, at the time from NTU, uh, Chihua Xion, uh, wanted to look into it. He's, he's an expert, uh, uh, but um, uh, we didn't get results. So I, I don't know why our initial trials didn't work, mm. um, but this is still open mm. uh, if you would be interested. 
Um, the um, it's some binding uh, energy here. Uh, we are uh, in the uh, tens of media electron volt range, mm. uh, as, uh, and the lifetimes. Uh, so if you look at the um, uh, uh, exotic feature widths, uh, they're also uh, quite um, uh, in alignment with it uh, in the absorption profile. Uh, uh, so um, we uh, would have, for example, ball radius uh, three nanometers range. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this is standard uh, two mm -hmm. six uh, in that regard. And uh, Ivan would give us the exact numbers. Uh, uh, no, I was just, if you're talking about this uh, three or two and a half layer structures, the, mm -hmm. am I right? So according to the map of the absorption spectrum and PL spectrum, it seems that what you have is that the ground exciton is a dark one because you oh, there's that, stock. yes, true. And if you have a ground dark exciton, it's very hard to get polaritons in there. Only in the case where your rabbit splitting is larger than the uh, stocks shift, which is quite large according to the figure. Well, if we look, uh, well, I was thinking about the other one, which but, one? Which one? Uh, yeah. Well, there, there are like two absorption peaks uh, and uh, yeah. uh, quite a wide PL spectrum uh, red shifted. Uh, uh, not this one. Yeah. I, I showed some other. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Where is it? Um, uh, is it maybe this one? No. Oh. Probably some, well, it doesn't really, okay. uh, uh, but yeah, it true. was a yeah. large shift between, usually when you have large shift between absorption and mm -hmm. uh, PL, it means that you have uh, bright excitons, which, are, which create the absorption, but they are high in energy than the dark excitons, which create the PL, but PL is quite, well, relatively weak. Because there are a lot of dark excitons, but they are, but they radiate slowly. Right. And uh, to, to have the polaritons, you need large oscillator strength. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to get the polaritonic emission in, in the systems where your darkest exciton is a, is, a, is a, where the ground exciton is a dark one. Mm -hmm. But can it be like designed here by shell for shell or probably number of layers to, to design the proper properties of this uh, ground yeah. state? It, uh, probably. Because as far as I don't know, in Ephraim's in Perovskite, one of these was huge, designed somehow by shape, by size, and they studied uh, uh, the brightness of ground state and mm -hmm. somehow optimize this for energy. Yeah, you can, you can play with it with a uh, quantum confinement or something like that, but. Yeah, if you would um, design this, um, uh, uh, we could grow it <laughs> for you. Yep. Um, it, the, uh, for the closed quantum mass, the, the, we have a really monolayer uh, precision. Mm -hmm. uh, it's atomic layer deposition, it's monolayer by monolayer. So the shell growth uh, will be very precise. Crown uh, with optimization, of course, crown is an isotropic probe. We should we keep the vertical thickness, but the width uh, we have to optimize, and there will be some distribution, uh, mm -hmm. but very reasonable. So, uh, if you want to design this, I think we could give it a try, and uh, it has not been done. Okay. Well, for you to think. Okay, guys, okay. we're a little running out of time, so let's thank Professor Wolf and Demir, first of all, for coming and taking